Good morning, and I'd love to extend an, a really warm welcome to everyone to this morning's service at Erwood Baptist Church. My name's Emma. You should hopefully know me by now, and this is Ken. Yep. How are you? I'm going well, Emma. Excellent. Awesome. Tell Excellent. me. So, we're in a really good series at the moment, and I'm getting a lot out of it. Yeah. It's got to be impossible. Yeah. And today's our last uh, sermon today. Really? Series, yeah. Oh. That's kind of sad. I'm yeah, it's really been a, enjoying it's this. It's been an amazing journey. Have there been any highlights for you? Yeah, last week uh, Terry asked me this question, and um, I focused on, on Moses mm. um, and just just finding himself in a situation that was totally impossible. But just reflecting on all the the narratives and the stories we've read about Moses, whether it's Joshua, uh, David. Um, and all these guys, Gideon and, and, and Rahab, and all yeah. these amazing individuals, yeah. the one thing that stood out for me is that there was a point, a tipping point in their life where they had to take that step of faith. Oh, wow. And that tipping point, I mean, whether it was to trust God with a widow, yeah. you know, making the bread, yeah. or for Gideon to send away the 20,000 and remain with 300, there's always a tipping point. Yeah. And and it's that tipping point that moves us into that space of just trusting God for the impossible. That's what stood yeah, out for me. Wow. Yeah. No, that's a really important observation. Yeah. What about you? What about me? So I've been really blown away by how God chooses the really unlikely person. Yeah. For me, sometimes I I wonder how's God going to use me? Yeah. Or I hear other people say that, I'm nobody, how is God going to use me? But like Rahab, for example, yeah. she's someone who would typically be excluded from society and people would think she's a nobody or yeah. she's actually someone who we want to keep away from. Yeah. But how powerfully did God think use her? Even Gideon himself says, mm -hmm. I am the least in my family, my family is the yeah. least in my tribe. He, yeah, he sees himself right at the bottom yeah. of the barrel, but God, yeah, like you said, uses the least. I know. And what comes out of that is that it's not about us, yeah. is it? Nah. Not at all. If it was about us, it would be a very different story. <laughs> right, yeah, right. We always look for the strongest, the yeah. most uh, eloquent, the, the bravest. The, yeah. We always look for those, but God looks yeah. at something very different. Yeah. Phenomenal. True. Well, today John is going to be preaching to us and he'll be talking from a story in Mark chapter 9 and the message is all about unbelief and there's a line that the father says to Jesus which is, Lord, help me with my unbelief mm -hmm. oh. and it's powerful and I'm actually quite excited to see what John does with this passage. Yeah. But before we launch into our service, how about I pray for us? Join us for prayer. Oh, holy God, you are most powerful and holy. You came down and you lived among us. You loved us so much that you died on the cross for us. And you have worked wonderful, powerful miracles all throughout history. You have made yourself known. And even still, sometimes we struggle with unbelief. There are times when all of us, at some point, struggle to realise or to acknowledge that you are real. There are times where we may doubt your power or your concern for us. So God, I pray that you will use today to counter our unbelief. Holy Spirit, come. Make yourself known. Make yourself felt. And God, I pray that you will help to overcome our unbelief. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh 
today from Mark chapter 9, where Jesus heals a little boy. They reached the place where the other disciples were, and they saw that there was a large crowd there with them. Some teachers of God's word were arguing with the disciples. The crowd, or the people in the crowd saw Jesus, and they were surprised and excited, so they ran to say hello to Jesus. Jesus asked his disciples, what is everybody arguing about? A man in the crowd raised his hand and he said to Jesus, Jesus, I brought my son to you. Something's wrong with him and he's not able to speak. Doctors can't help him and I asked your disciples to kill him, but they weren't able to do it either. Jesus replied, 
you people today still don't believe in God. It's difficult for me to be patient with you. Bring the boy to me. So the people brought the boy to Jesus. When they did, the boy fell to the ground. Jesus asked his father, how long has he been like this? He's been like this since he was a small boy, the father replied. Please be kind to us. If you can do anything, please help us. Jesus looked at the father. He shouldn't say, if I can do anything. Everything is possible for those who believe. Immediately, the boy's father shouted, Oh, I believe! Help me to believe more! Jesus healed the little boy. The boy was lying really still, so some of the people thought he must be dead. But Jesus held out his hand and grabbed the little boy's and helped him up. He was all healed. Jesus went into the house with the disciples and they were alone there. The disciples asked him, why couldn't we help the boy? Jesus said to them, you must pray. This kind of problem can't be healed unless you pray. Wow. So there's a big group of people and in this big group of people, one of the men brought his son to see Jesus. See, his, his son was really sick and doctors couldn't fix what was wrong with him. And he asked the disciples, Jesus' closest friends to help, but they couldn't help either. But the man knew Jesus could help. So he asked Jesus if he would heal his little boy. But he kind of believed Jesus could heal him and he kind of also knew that it was a big deal. So maybe Jesus, pretty sure Jesus could help. And Jesus said, you need to trust me. You have to believe that I can do it. Now, at the end, the disciples said, they asked Jesus why they couldn't do anything. And do you, do you remember what Jesus said? He said, you need to pray. Why would they need to pray in order to help the little boy? Why do you think? Well, because the disciples couldn't do anything. They're just men, right? And, and this little boy had something with, wrong with him that no medicine could fix. So it wasn't that he needed other people. Who did he need? Who could help? God, right? We've been hearing so many stories about God being able to do things that are impossible things that we think are impossible. They'd be impossible for any of us to do, right? Let's see if we can remember all the stories we've been hearing. There is a story about this big, big sea and the people, God's people come to it and they're stuck, right? And the soldiers are chasing them. And do you remember what happens? God makes the water split so it's dry right down the middle and they cross on dry land. Could you do that? Could you make the water part like that? Me either. No man could do that. No woman could do that. No kid could do that. But who could do that? God can do that, right? And then we heard a story about God's people coming to a big river where the water was like really deep and running really fast and the people had to cross and what happened God told them to step in the water and all the water dried up and they were able to cross on dry land and we heard a story about a shepherd boy named David and he fought a giant warrior right named Goliath and who won that battle David did, didn't he? Because he was fighting for God. And so God helped him be, defeat the big warrior. And we heard a story about a man named Gideon. And he and 300 men defeated a whole army. And all they had were trumpets 
and jugs and candles. That doesn't sound like what you take into a battle, does it? But God was on their side and God did what no man could do. And we heard a story about Rahab and how she protected God's spies. And when the whole city came crumbling down, she and her family were safe, right? Because she trusted God and God took care of her. And then last week we heard a story about the widow with her oil and her flour. And God did a miracle where it just kept, it never ran out, right? Every time she went to make some more bread, there was more oil and more flour. And he took care of her and Elijah all the way through a drought and a famine when there was no food around and no water. So God did miracles. Remember, a miracle is something only God can do. He did things that for any of us would be impossible. But is anything impossible for God? Nope, nothing. Now, sometimes things seem so big, they seem so impossible, like there's nothing that could fix it, right? But is anything really impossible? Not for God. You know who the best, the best people I found to remember the stories and remember that nothing's impossible for God? Kids. You guys are great at believing God and remembering his stories. And sometimes we grown-ups, we need you to remind us that nothing's impossible for God. And we can all come together and we can pray and we can ask God to help us. And he wants us to trust him and remember that he can do anything, even heal a little boy that nobody else could help. Hi everybody. So the last few weeks here at Elwood Baptist, we've been working through this series, God of the Impossible. And we've been looking at how when things are bleak and our faith is stretched to its limits, we can still turn to a God who's able to do impossible things. But look, there's this um, funny thing about the impossible. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but the thing about impossible things is they're not possible. Like just by definition, if something's impossible, it can't happen, it, it can't be done. So it's actually, I mean, it's entirely reasonable to not believe that impossible things can happen. Yet those of us who are Christians have faith in a God uh, for who the scriptures say again and again and again that nothing is impossible. We have faith, we trust, we believe that God is who God says God is. Yet, I think it can often just feel like a, a play on words to say nothing is impossible with God in a world where it actually seems like lots of things are impossible and God doesn't seem to be doing everything that God could be doing. I mean, it can feel like we're playing with hypotheticals when really in the real world it seems like not everything is possible sometimes the limits between what's possible and what's impossible are actually really clear and hard to deny and this means that faith isn't always straightforward and it's certainly not always easy it's one thing to read stories in the scriptures of God doing amazing things, and it can often feel like God doesn't do now what he did back then in Bible times. And maybe if we got to see some more dried up oceans or some more miraculous victories or really any sort of miracle, it would be easier to have faith. But the reality is God doesn't seem to do those things very much anymore, if ever. The truth is... Faith is hard and complicated. And even if you fully believe and trust that God can do anything, day by day amidst the struggles and disappointments and tragedies of life, 
faith is hard. And for most of us, our faith, our belief, our trust in God is always complicated and changing. It's never pure. It's not an on or off faith or no faith type of thing. Faith ends up being uh, not an either or all, but a messy both and if but fluid, unpredictable kind of thing. Faith and doubt mix together in our hearts and in our minds, almost as if they're, they're two sides of a coin. Today we're jumping out of the Old Testament and we're going to Mark chapter 9. Uh, and we're looking at this story that shows the reality of faith in the world where it's not always easy or straightforward to believe and trust in God. And in this passage in, in Mark chapter 9, we see how faith can be complicated and why that's okay. The beginning of Mark chapter 9, we see Jesus, uh, not in the beginning, sorry, verse 16, if you're reading along of Mark chapter 9, we see Jesus approaching a crowd who are arguing with his disciples about something. And Jesus asks what's going on, and this man speaks out. He's the father of a child who he's brought with him, and he says that he, he brought his son to the disciples to be healed, but the disciples haven't been able to deliver. They can't help the boy, and this has led to this, this argument between the disciples and, and the crowd and the religious authorities in the crowd. And the father in verse 17 describes his son's condition to Jesus. He says that he has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it, it seizes him, it dashes him down and he, he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And then further down in verse 21, we find out that this has been happening since the child, ever since he was born. And that sometimes it's so bad that he gets thrown into the fire, or into water, almost like he's trying to kill him. Now, this passage describes the cause of this illness as being spiritual. He has a, he has a spirit that is doing it to him. But, but to us today, reading the story, um, it sounds like probably what's wrong with the boy is severe epilepsy. So if it's a spiritual thing that's going on, then what's required is an exorcism. But if it's a, a medical thing, then what's required is a healing. And it sounds like it's probably a medical thing, epilepsy. Epilepsy is a, a disorder that has been around since basically as far back as the historical record goes. And in, in ancient times and in the times of Jesus, it was generally thought that epilepsy was a spiritual thing. that was caused by spirits. And I mean, it kind of makes sense when you think about it a seizure looks like someone's being attacked by something in fact our, our word epilepsy it actually comes from a greek word that means something like to seize upon to take hold of or to attack now today we know that epilepsy is not caused by a spiritual possession but to be honest whether this is a spiritual thing or a neurological disorder whether this is something that requires an exorcism from Jesus or a healing from Jesus, it's really neither here nor there. Because this story is not really about the healing miracle. We see in verse 27 near the end of this section that even when Jesus does the healing, they don't make a big deal about it. There's no celebration or anything like that. In fact, instead there's a scene change. And we skip to verse 28 where the disciples are sitting with Jesus in a house and asking him, how come we couldn't heal this boy? Why weren't we able to do it? And the answer that Jesus gives is prayer. What's needed is prayer because you can't do it. Only God can do it. What you have to do is have faith that it is possible. So what this story is really about is faith. The disciples are confused as they're unable to heal the boy and the father is desperate and unsure whether a better future is possible for his son. And Jesus is kind of frustrated at all of them. And what this passage shows is what's needed is faith. That's why Jesus is frustrated. Where is your faith? Where is your trust that God can change things? Where is your trust that with God a better future is possible? Where is your trust that God healing is possible? Trust that God can do what seems, well, what seems impossible. But faith is not always easy. I mean, the disciples have seen 
Jesus cast out demons and heal the sick. I mean, earlier in Mark, the disciples themselves have cast out demons and healed the sick. But here, they're unable to do it. They're impotent and their faith is shook. What, what do we do? What do we do wrong? They ask Jesus. And the Father is hopeful. Well, I mean, at the very least, the Father is desperate. But even he's unsure. He's not sure that Jesus can do it. In verse 22, we see the Father saying to Jesus, But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. If you are able to do anything. And Jesus says, If you are able. I mean, he's kind of offended by the implication, If I'm able. What do you mean, if I'm able? The question is not if I'm able to do it or not. The question is, do you believe I can do it? All things can be done for the one who believes. Verse 23. And the father says, I believe. Help my unbelief. Desperate, honest, paradoxical. I believe, help my unbelief. This is the complicated nature of faith. It's entirely possible to have faith and at the same time acknowledge your lack of faith. It's paradoxical, but it's not contradictory. It's not hypocritical. I believe, help my unbelief. Faith is sort of a little bit like laughter. See, laughter is, is good for us. It, it releases uh, endorphins that increase our mood and are good for our mental and, and physical health. Fake laughter is also good for us. Even fake laughter, forced laughter, laughter that you put on even though you're just totally not feeling it in the moment, even fake laughter sort of ends up being real anyway. A fake laugh is also good for us. It also releases those good endorphins. You know, you can go to these laughter therapy classes that sometimes called laugh yoga. Now, basically, a bunch of people get together with, with an instructor. They don't know each other and, and they get together and they laugh. They just laugh, not about anything. They just laugh. They're not necessarily feeling it. It's fake, but they laugh and it releases endorphins and that improves your mood and the whole thing's a, a little bit silly. Everyone around you is laughing and it's a bit dumb and it's a bit strange, but it's also kind of funny. And even though you're just faking that laugh, eventually that laugh sort of becomes real. Like when you're watching a, a TV show, a comedy on TV, and there's that canned laughter in the background that sort of shows you when you're supposed to laugh, but it also kind of helps you laugh or you know, you go to a bad comedy gig and the comedian on stage is pretty average, but there's a room full of people laughing and just being in the room with people laughing makes you laugh. Faith is a little bit like laughter. And laughter doesn't have to be real to be real. And in fact, most of the time, there's not really any meaningful difference between a real laugh and a fake laugh. Laughter doesn't have to be pure or authentic to be real. I believe, help my unbelief. Sometimes wanting to believe, saying you believe, and also acknowledging that you sort of right now in the moment don't fully believe is enough. Faith doesn't always have to be absolutely genuine or absolutely pure to be real. Jesus says all things can be done for the one who believes. The father of the boy says, I believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus heals the boy. To believe that God is a God of the impossible, but to also sort of think that perhaps this problem, this challenge, this thing I'm dealing with, this barrier, this situation may just be impossible is perfectly reasonable. Faith and doubt, belief and unbelief are paradoxical, but they aren't contradictory. And doubt or unbelief shouldn't stop you from looking to God. 
In fact, it doesn't really matter whether you think something is impossible or not. What matters is who you turn to when faced with the impossible. God doesn't need you to have everything sorted in your mind before you come to him. God doesn't require your faith to be perfect or to be 100% pure or 100% simple and straightforward and black and white all the time. God doesn't need that. And in fact, the best response to a messy complicated, conflicted, uncertain faith isn't to try and go off and get everything sorted in your head first and then come to God. The best thing to do is to come to God how you are. The father of the boy, in all his doubt and all his confusion and all his unbelief, throws himself desperately on Jesus' mercy. Despite the fact that he isn't fully convinced that Jesus can actually do anything, he throws himself on Jesus' mercy. He acknowledges the conflicted nature of his faith. And that is enough. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to be willing to look. Seek and you will find. Ask and you will receive. I want to finish with the words of Frederick Beekner, who is an American author and preacher, he says this. Go to God the way the father of the sick boy did and ask him. Pray to him is what I'm saying. In whatever words you have, and if the little voice that is inside all of us is the inheritance of generations of unfaith, if this little voice inside us says, but I don't believe, I don't believe. Don't worry too much. Just keep on anyway. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Is the best any of us can do, really. But thank God, it is enough. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If anyone has any prayer requests, please send us an email. There's an email address down the bottom of the screen. We'd love to hear from you. Let me close with a passage from Romans 8. I think this speaks beautifully against any element of unbelief we might have. From verse 31, Paul says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him for all of us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now let me pray. Holy God, this morning we've heard about unbelief and we've heard the Father's plea for you to come and act against this unbelief, to help us in our unbelief. So God, I just pray for anyone here today, anyone watching who is struggling to believe you, anyone who is struggling to trust you, Lord God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come, that you will impress on them your presence, impress on them your dependability. As Paul says, let us be convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any other power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. Let none of this separate us from you, God. Let none of this cause unbelief in you. 
We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you next week. i